Welcome to update number three for Rocket Frame 87. The project is a building and exploring simulator where you control three crash survivors stranded on an alien world. Uh, the project is at its very early stages right now, so I'm just working through some of the mechanics. Big improvements this time are streamlining of player modes, a significant improvement of inventory management system, and the construction of buildings. Oh, and crabs. Wild land crabs. Well, actually, they're not that wild. They mostly just wander around and bump into things, but they will become much more wild in the future. So let's start with the player modes. If we start the game here, click on any of the players, um, we have the different modes. So what you can do with right or left mouse depends on which mode you're in. I formerly had, I think, six different modes of everything from gathering to building to researching and a couple of combat modes um, and i really came to the conclusion that a lot of the non-combat modes were pretty similar so i compressed that all into basically just working so we have corky here and he basically has working and resting and that's it um, obviously if we were to pick up a weapon so let's send jake over here he's going to pick up a weapon and now he also has attack modes available the other little change is just to make it clear exactly what mode you're in. When you're in attack mode, the cursor changes to the this sort of uh, crosshairs. So hopefully you don't accidentally kill your fellow colonist when you think you're, you know, working or something. Right. So the next item is inventory management. Let's quit him. Inventory management was really kind of a big deal, especially as I had lots of different things in the game. Um, and let me start by saying, if anyone's actually watching this, I really appreciate it. I realize there's a lot of people out there with different game projects, and you could be watching another update that's showing some really cool explosions and smoke trails and blood splatter effects, or you could be watching this, which is inventory management. So thanks. Right, getting back to inventory management. Um, the basic problem that I had was uh, trying to define things like container sizes and how things would stack. Um, so we have things like, um, here we have arrows, and we show that there are eight of them. Now, we can send Sarah, and she will pick up arrows. So a colonist is really not all that big, so there is a maximum amount of things that they can carry. And here we see arrows. The maximum stacking of arrows because it is a well basically somebody's backpack or what they carry on the person is small um, there's a maximum limit now if we have her center over here and try and pick up some logs there's a hundred logs and she picks up one so the difference there is essentially that uh, she is considered a small container so logs, even though they will stack on an unlimited basis if they're sitting around outside, uh, if they're in a small container, so either, let's say, a colonist backpack or something like this little storage crate, um, they have a limited stacking. So if we can switch, I will now show what a total geek I really am. Um, so I actually do things like flowcharts in my spare time. Um, I find this actually very handy to try and keep things straight in my mind. So here I basically have defined how these things transfer from one object in game to the other. So it all kind of goes through the colonist um, and each colonist um, is going to have storage items in a specific slot. Um, and so if there are things lying around outside on the ground, um, obviously you have this unlimited storage concept, um, but everything is going to be transferred through a colonist into, let's say, a container or building, that sort of thing. Um, also defining rules, that's pretty important. Uh, so, for example, items with condition will never stack. So if it's something like a tool or a weapon, um, it could be slightly worn. And obviously, if you stack those, then you will lose track of what that condition really is because it's something that's discrete and it applies to one specific um, instance of that, uh, of that item. So again, just defining rules. Um, you know, large items will stack in large containers like the outdoors. Small items will stack in either small or large containers. If it's a small container, then there's a, a limit and so forth. So if we get back to the game, we can see all this in action. Um, again, Sarah, she already has one unit of logs, which is the maximum she can carry. 
She can walk up and down over the top of this all she wants and will not pick up any more. Um, and if we drop, we see also it's an automatic stacking. So 99 goes back to 100 logs. They will automatically try to stack things in a convenient pile. The way things are displayed also has been refined and improved. So um, here we see this is something that does not have a condition. It has a stacking. So you see there's 100 of them. However, this being a tool has a condition. So we see that's in pretty good condition. The monoculars, perfect condition. The bow, um, not such good shape. And the final thing that we have, let's go to, let's have her pick up something that you can eat. So the emergency rations. Here we have our emergency rations. Um, so if there's something that you can actually do with an object, um, then that's also um, shown. So in this case, uh, emergency rations are something that she can eat. So you may eat one of those. Um, I guess you can make this a little more clear. I believe this was the indication for how much hunger. So if we click on it, we'll see she is now less hungry. Yum yum. So the next item is buildings. So the way this is handled is we have a build menu where you would select the type of building you're list, uh, looking to build. You would select the location you want it. Then you would click and have to assign one of the colonists to actually do the, the labor, the construction. So right now, since the game is just starting, we only have uh, the very simplest structures. So we have a campfire, campsite, and hut. And so we can go through that, and that's all there is. Um, obviously, there's uh, some of them are larger than others. So a hut is a small object here. Hmm, let's do this. Let's put up a hut here, just to show you. And I see I actually still have some debugging parameters in here, but uh, again, that's just to try and make things easy for me. So she's in working mode, so she can go over here and she will start working on adding labor to this particular hut. Um, one big feature that I've added is that the buildings all actually will now deduct building materials. So we see logs is now 92 uh, because building a hut required some building materials. So stone is 77, logs 92. Um, deducts the appropriate building materials. What I've also included, again, this is really just sort of a placeholder. Oops, he is resting. Just sort of a placeholder. Um, there's going to be different levels of building depending on the um, science that you've achieved. So again, uh, science, let's uh, have him start uh, doing some research. Just a placeholder. Um, there will be an actual research tree, but right now I was interested in the construction of buildings, so we wanted to uh, just have you know, just have something that would show that the ability to unlock higher level structures. So hopefully he will get done with this in a moment. Good. So he's done with that research, and we go to the build, and we see we have now unlocked a bunch of different structures. So we now have about half a dozen different structures here. Um, one of which being this here, which is the small cabin. Right, so this was a uh, one by two instead of a one by one or a two by two, and this actually required a little bit more um, interesting things with code. So, um, this actually brings us to the next point, which is uh, some drawing, uh, some artwork that I had done. So if we can switch just for a moment, So creating a bunch of new buildings also required some new artwork, and I am by no means a natural artist, but I did learn one interesting little trick that I thought I would share. So if we switch here, this is Inkscape. This is the program I usually use, and this is kind of a scratch pad. This is just something where I would try and draw sticks and rocks and put them together in interesting ways. Um, again, just as, a, just as a, a quick thing to sketch out some ideas. So what I've been using, uh, you notice down here, uh, Inkscape has a very nice uh, built-in sort of color palette. And a lot of these, you know, here again, some of these are brown tones. And I thought initially that this would uh, make some interesting looking, uh, you know, for uh, wood. Um, here we see up here, this is kind of a, a board that I had drawn. Here are some sticks. Okay. Um, and again, using the, the standard color palette, I was able to come up with, uh, for the new buildings, it was basically sort of a a cabin, uh, kind of a traditional log, log cabin. And so I was able to come up with something that looked like this. This was kind of my, my first attempt. Uh, a bunch of shingles, you know, again, you're seeing it from the top. 
So you can tell what it is, but I wasn't really that happy with it. Um, so I, I guess when I was trying to narrow it down, the one thing that occurred to me was the colors weren't quite right. So I decided to try to analyze this, and um, the way I did it was I took a game that um, that has very good artwork, and that is, I'll show this here. Um, I don't know if everyone's played this. Uh, this game is called Banished. Um, excellent game, and I've always really admired it. The artwork looks nice, and it looks very natural. So the, the trees look natural, um, the buildings, the wood, it, it looks it looks very nice. Uh, also an indie game. Um, <laughs> I would probably have to work for 10 years to get something as nice as this, but um, something I admired. But anyway, I thought I would just try and take a look specifically at the colors and see if I could figure out um, kind of what was bugging me about my, you know, the artwork that I was working on. So what I did here was take uh, some of the uh, artwork that I had and uh, compare it to some of the artwork that was in Banished. Um, we're in Photoshop now, and Photoshop has this nice little tool where you can analyze colors. So click here. Um, so let's pick one. So this is one of the, uh, this, is, this is a green tone. So this is a, a green tone that's part of the default color scheme. And if you look here, it will show you hue, saturation, and brightness, um, or RGB. And either one of these three is enough to specify the color. They're just different ways of, of going about it. Um, and again, as I said, I'm certainly no artist. But just looking at some of the colors, um, so we see here, this is kind of one of their default greens. This is a little bit brighter green. Again the parameters seem to change. This here is one of the browns, and this is a specifically a brown that I was using for wood tones. Again, the parameters all kind of change. But the one interesting thing to note is that the saturation for all three of these values is identical, 73%. And this is actually, as I learned, kind of a high value. So if we take this same tool and look at um, here, here are some of the colors that you see from Banished. And again, if you pay attention only to the saturation value, you see 50%, 33%, 59, that's really the highest that they have, 36%. It's very rare that any of the saturation values go above 50%. So I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this is a pattern. So essentially what I did um, was create custom color palettes, not by trying to mix colors using the, this, uh, this area here, but strictly by changing the saturation. So if I go to, let's say, this value here and change only the, sat the saturation, uh, and again, looking for consistency, since they picked 73%, um, I basically just said, well, let's arbitrarily cut by 20%. 20, uh, 20 so if we change this to 58%, we end up with this new color, which is actually this color here, which actually looks like a much more natural wood tone. I did the same thing with the greens, um, and I came up with my own custom color palette that, for the most part, just takes the existing ones and desaturates them. But it really makes kind of a nice difference. So I'll go cancel, and if we go back to this, this was my initial attempt using the default colors, and this was my improved attempt um, using my own custom color palette. I did a few other little things, like I changed the uh, the shingles. The shingles are a little more irregular now, but again, if we look at a before and after. Um, just a couple little minor changes to the color palette uh, makes it look much more natural. So um, hope this was helpful. Uh, I certainly found it made a big difference in my art and um, hope it's something you can use. We switch Thank back you. to the in-game view. We can see what this looks like in-game. Um, I still have a few little scaling issues. So right now uh, the small cabin is not to scale with the hut. Hut should uh, be smaller in proportion. And then obviously the colonists are a little on the large size. Um, but uh, again, minor scaling issue. Main point is, I'm pretty happy with the way this turned out. So thanks for watching and uh, have a great day.